Oh dear Father in heaven, thank you for the Sabbath blessings and uh, raise our hope and prayer that uh, you speak to our souls as we look at the last points in this series and that uh, we may represent you as uh, according to the inspiration in Jesus' name. Amen. Um, I want to welcome us into this, uh, this, the, the presentation of this hour. And uh, it is uh, my prayer that um, everything that we speak, that uh, the Lord will help us to understand his will and uh, be able to walk uh, in righteousness. And so I'd like just to look at a few points as we bring this to a close. And uh, I will be praying that uh, the information may resonate with us and that it has been a blessing going through this series of uh, family life. And I have entitled uh, the presentation uh, Canon before us because uh, I want to look at uh, the history of the children of Israel and what was said before them and how God wanted them to uh, behave and uh, do the, their work. We have uh, an example of the lessons of Israel, Israelites uh, being given to us as uh, they were traveling from uh, Egypt to Canaan. And these lessons are worthy of uh, our learning today because there are admonitions that were given for to be an example to us who have come to the end of the world. And so without uh, much time, I'd like just to share with us some, some thoughts as we bring this to a close in this session for me life. We are told in uh, uh, Peter's Council to Parents, page 29, paragraph 3 to 6, that um, just before the firstborn was slain in Egypt, the Lord instructed the Israelites to gather their children into their houses with them and uh, to strike the lintel and the two side posts of their doors with uh, blood so that uh, when the destroying angel went through the land, uh, he will recognize the houses thus marked as the dwelling places of Christ uh, our followers and uh, pass over them. Today we must gather our children about us if we desire to save them from the destructive power of the evil one. The conflict between Christ and Satan will increase in intensity until the end of this earth history. We are to have faith in the blood of Christ in order that we may pass safely through the perilous times just before us. If we work diligently upon the plan of addition, we shall not be barren in a knowledge of Christ. We should, however, take heed to ourselves lest we fall because we do not cherish and cultivate the Christian graces. He that lacketh these things is blind and cannot see afar off and hath forgotten that he was purged from his old sins. This scripture brings to view those who are in, uh, in a divided state, those who talk as they please, those who indulge appetite and passionate speech, failing to take themselves failing to take themselves in hand. Such a persons have no moral strength to carry out the principle that will bring to them as overcome as the crown of life. They are like a man who has forgotten that he has been purged from his old sins. And so the story of uh, the Israelites before they entered into the promised land is something that uh, is before us. And uh, we should learn those lessons humbly and be able to follow after the, what the Lord is telling us. Now, uh, what I wanted to point out is that um, 
many, many, many will fail to uh, enter into the promised land because uh, they have decided to raise up their families and do things according to their own uh, their own wisdom and not the wisdom of God. But uh, as a family, as we are marching to Zion, we are to raise up families in the way that the Lord will want us to raise them so that we may present them in the land of Canaan and polluted people are people sanctified to possess that goodly land. Now, I'm not advocating works, but also I'm not exempting them. I say that by the grace of Jesus Christ, who authored the family in the book of Genesis, can be able to instruct us in the ways that we can keep our families and present them pure before his throne of grace. And we know that that sanctifying power comes from Jesus Christ uh, himself and not um, from any human being. Our work is to yield unto the Lord and let him do the works that um, he would want to do in us. So as um, we see the end coming, we are told that the lessons of the children of Israel is, is before us. Let us gather our children into our houses. And um, in Review and Herald, uh, September 19, 1854, Again, uh, there's something interesting. Uh, we read that uh, the destroying angel is soon to go forth again, not to destroy the firstborn alone, but to slay utterly old and young, both men, women, and little children who have not the mark. Parents, if you wish to save your children, separate them from the world, keep them from the company of wicked children. For if you suffer them to go with wicked children, you cannot prevent them from partaking of their wickedness and being corrupted. That... Uh, this uh, idea of uh, just allowing our children to be with anyone and uh, being in the company of uh, any person is not uh, the best idea at all. We should do everything we can before, be, because canon is before us, we should do everything we can to make sure that our children are in the company that will not corrupt them, that will not make them be partakers of wickedness. Continued on, we are told it is your seldom, it's your solemn duty to watch over your children, to choose the society at to choose the society at all time for them. Learn your children, to, learn your children to obey you, then can they more easily obey the commandments of God and yield to his requirements. Don't let us neglect to pray with and for our children. He that said, suffer little children to come unto me and forbid them not, will listen to our prayers for them and the seal or mark of believing parents will cover their children if they are trained up in the nurture and admonition of the Lord. Now, look at um, the book of Lamentation. Lamentation to... Verse 19, I pray, I, 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 yes, Lamentation 2.19. We are told in Lamentation 2.19 that um, Arise, cry out in the night. In the beginning of the watches, pour out thine heart like water before the face of the Lord. Lift up thy hands toward him for the life of the young children that faint for hunger in the top of every street. And so, our duty as parents is to arise and cry for these children if they are going to be saved because Canaan is before us. And even if Canaan was not before us, we have a responsibility if we are to live longer in this earth to make sure that um, everything is going according to what the Lord has uh, instructed us. In Exodus 19, 12, and the man said unto the Lord, Hast thou here any besides son-in-law and thy sons and thy daughters and whatsoever thou hast in the city? Bring them out of this place, for we still, for we will destroy this place because the cry of them is waxing great before the face of the Lord, and the Lord has sent us to destroy it. So you find that um, we should be seeking in every way to save our family members. That is uh, the son-in-law, thy sons, thy daughters, and whosoever is in the city that is uh, really related to you. Do everything to try and save your family. Malachi 4.4. 4, Remember ye the law of Moses, my servant, which I commanded unto him in horror for all Israel with the statutes and judgments. Behold, I'll send you Elijah the prophet before the coming 
of the great and dreadful day of the Lord, and he shall turn uh, the heart of the fathers to the children, and the heart of the children to their fathers, lest I come and smite to each the earth with a curse. And so again, you see the relationship between the end time and uh, working for your families. The law of Moses given in Horeb forbids any form of adultery and all city in marriage and family circle. Before God destroys this earth, the sanctity of the family circle will be will form part of the third angel's message and be sounded in the be sounded to the world. And so uh, the special work of parents, child guidance 558.1, the special work of parents is to make the laws of God plain to their children and to urge their obedience to them that they may see the importance of obeying God all the days of their lives. This was the work of Moses. He was to enjoin upon parents their duty to give to their children an example of strict obedience. And this is the work that above everything else must be done in the home life today. It is to accompany the third angel's message. The instruction, the parents instructing their children to be in obedience to their heavenly father. And uh, we saw that the best way to teach children to be obedient to their heavenly father is for you yourself to be obedient to the heavenly father. Otherwise, you will be attempting an impossibility because children are created or um, they are given the ability to adapt faster to what they see rather than to what they hear. They will be able to pick things quickly if they see them practically. That is why you see that children watch TVs and soon within seconds you are seeing them mimicking everything that they have seen on the TV. And so if our children behold us doing uh, or, or being obedient to our Heavenly Father, it is easier for them to adapt than tell these children, love the Lord, do this, do that. Christianity is not about do this and do that. It's not about the don'ts. Christianity is a lifestyle where actually somebody chooses to uh, live a, a life of a relationship with uh, what he has decided to relate with. And if it is God, then relate with him. It's not about do this and don't do this. It is about forming a lasting relationship with our, our Heavenly Father. And so if they see this relationship concrete in our houses, then they'll be moved and wooed towards it rather than just being told you have to do this and uh, you have to do that. Um, the mouth of the Lord has spoken through the prophetess and uh, let all those who believe in her inspiration accept it as the truth. And so uh, these things that we are reading are not uh, man-made things, but um, uh, the things that uh, the Lord has talked or has um, uh, has given them to his, uh, to his servant so that uh, we may be able to be established in present truth. In um, the book of... Uh, uh, first Chronicles, is it First Chronicles? Um, uh, I'll, I'll, I'll just be there in a moment. The book of, um, it is Second Chronicles, sorry. The book of Second Chronicles. And uh, I'll be giving you a, a verse in a moment. That is um, chapter um, Chapter 20, verses 20. There, there are many counsels that we have been given in inspiration. And when we talk about inspiration, we talk about the totality of inspiration. That is uh, the word of God and uh, the writings of Sister White. We are told, And they arose early in the morning and went forth into the wilderness of Tekoa. And as they went forth, Jehoshaphat, Students said, Hear me, O Judah, and ye inhabitants of Jerusalem. Believe in the Lord your God, so you shall be established. Believe his prophets, prophet, so you shall prosper. It may be that uh, the reason why we are not seeing much prosperity among us, both in the family circle, spiritual life, physical, uh, social life, and all these things, is because we are not taking heed to inspiration. That is the word of God, both written and uh, the still voice of God and the messengers that he's sending among us, that is the teachers of the word of God, the evangelists, the pastors, the elders, and the prophets among us. And so uh, 
if we want to prosper and be established, then let us take the totality of inspiration before it is too late. Again, um, great blessing and privileges are ours. We may secure the most valuable heavenly treasures. Let ministers and people remember that gospel truth ruins if it does not save. The soul that refuses to listen to those invitations of mercy from day to day can soon listen to the most urgent appeals without an emotion stirring his soul. Now, let us look at the rewards of those uh, parents who have been faithful. And uh, uh, I, I want just to say this as uh, I go into this section of uh, reward, that um, whatever we are doing, it's not for the reward for heaven, neither is it for the fear of being lost. We are doing everything we are doing because we have a relationship with our Heavenly Father. If we only do things because there is a reward, what if there was not a reward? Then it means we will be some, uh, we will be different. We will behave in different way. And uh, if we only do things because we shall be punished, then the motivation is wrong. What if there was no punishment? It means we will do things contrary to what we are doing today. So it's not for the motivation of reward. It is not for the fear of being punished that we do what we do, but we do because we understand in our hearts that this is the right thing to do and this is what is fit for the relationship that uh, we are uh, in. And so uh, in uh, Child Garden, page 560, and uh, how I pray that people have started reading this book, Child Garden, if they have never read it, and if they have ever read it, they will start reading it again. A graphic scene of the Judgment Day, I had a dream once in which I saw a large company gathered together, and suddenly the heavens gathered blackness, the thunder rolled, the lightning flashed, and a voice louder than the heaviest peals of thunder sound, sounded through the heavens and the earth saying, it is done. Part of the company with the pallid faces sprang forward with a wail of agony crying out, oh, I am not ready. The question was asked, why are you not ready? Why have you not improved the opportunities I graciously gave you? I woke up with the crying ringing in my ears. I am not ready. I am unsaved, lost, lost, eternally lost. Now, concerning this quote, you are not ready or I am not ready and eternally saved. Why are you not ready? There is a compliment uh, verse that goes with that in the in the book of uh, Jeremiah chapter 13, verses 20, I read it and read it every time. That is Jeremiah 13, verses 20. Uh, and uh, I'll just uh, highlight this. I thought uh, I had highlighted. And so this is the issue. Lift up your eyes and behold them that come from the north. Where is the flock that was given thee, thy beautiful flock? Why is it that you are not ready and why is it that your family is not ready? That is the question that we have to start asking ourselves. Why is it you are not ready, I am not ready, and why is it that the flock is not ready? It is because some things have preoccupied our lives and uh, raising up godly families have been a secondary thing. And uh, sometimes you hear about these things of economy and all. Yes, economy is harsh and somebody is just uh, surviving to put something on the table. People are barely living, my friends. But I thank the Lord also in that barely living, actually the, God has, the Lord has been faithful unto us that um, his children around the world, although they have been faced with difficulties, it has been a disciplining period. So that even when the time of no buying and selling comes, at least they are used to a certain lifestyle that I can go this period of time without spending any shilling. And so we should not complain so much about the economy. Yes, it is harsh. And uh, you have heard me say several, some people I have said to them, yes, the economy is harsh and we are barely living. But then it has been a, a tutorial, it has been a tutor, it has been a lesson to me that uh, I can endure some period without buying and selling. And uh, I thank the Lord for that. Even amidst everything uh, uh, that seems negative, there's something positive. And so let us not reach that day and say, I'm unprepared and I haven't prepared my family. And uh, 
have some excuse that I was doing this and I was doing that. Let, let, let it not be uh, like that. In view of the solemn responsibility that, that, that rest upon us, let us contemplate the future that uh, we may understand what we must do in order to meet it. In that day shall we be confronted with neglect and content of God and his mercy, with the rejection of his truth and love. In the solemn assembly of the last day, in the hearing of the universe, will be read the reasons of the condemnation of the sin. For the first time, parents will learn what has been the secret life of their children. Children will see how many wrongs they have committed against their parents. There will be a general revealing of the secrets and motives of the heart, for that which is hid will be made manifest. Those who have made sport of solemn things connected with the judgment will be sobered as they face its terrible reality. May God have mass on us that uh, there are things which are secret in us and in our children that we don't understand and we don't take time to examine them and be able to help each other out. Shall get in 561.1. When God asks, where are the children? Parents who have neglected their God-given responsibilities must meet the neglect in the judgment. The Lord will then inquire, where are the children that I gave you to train for me? That is Jeremiah 13, 20, which we have read. Why are they not at my right hand? Many parents will then see that unwise love blinded their eyes to their children's faults and left those children to develop deform, deformed uh, characters and fit for heaven. Others will see that they did not give their children time and attention, love and tenderness. Their own neglect of duty made the children what they are. Parents, if you lose your opportunity, God pity you, for in the day of judgment, God will say, what have you done with my flock, my beautiful flock? And you want to put that, um, you want to put that besides Jeremiah uh, 13 verse 20, something that uh, I have to do in the midst of presentation. What reason can I give? What reason can you give for when you are asked where is the beautiful flock that um, I gave unto you? Jeremiah uh, 13, 20, and uh, that is uh, uh, Child Guidance 561.2, Child Guidance 561.2. Child Guidance 561.2. Will anyone have uh, something reasonable to tell the Lord when he asks uh, where is that uh, little beautiful flock? Uh, that um, uh, I gave unto you. We are told that uh, before the Lord, uh, every, every voice will be hushed. Uh, those who have ever thought of uh, giving God's excuse, they'll have nothing to say. Suppose you should get to heaven and none of your children be there. Child Guide in 561.3. How could you say to God, here I am, Lord, and the children which thou hast given me? Heaven marks the neglect of parents. It is recorded in the books of heaven. Again, continued on, families will pass in review before God. When parents and children meet at the final reckoning, what a sin will be presented. Thousands of children who have uh, been slaves to appetite and debasing vice whose lives are Moral wrecks will stand face to face with the parents who made them what they are. Who but the parents must bear this fearful responsibility? Did the Lord make this youth corrupt or no? He made them in his image. A little lower than the angels. Who then has done the fearful work of forming the life character? Who changed their character so that they do not bear the impress of God and must be forever separated from his presence as too impure to have any place with the pure angels in um, uh, holy heaven. These are the questions that um, uh, have to be asked. These are the questions that um, have to be asked. What um, will uh, you tell the Lord when uh, you are asked about these things? This is the question that um, we have to ask ourselves, everyone. We are told uh, were the sins of the parents transmitted to the children in perverted appetites and passions? And was the work completed by the pleasure-loving mother in neglecting to properly train them according to the pattern given her? 
all these mothers will pass in review before God just as surely as they exist. Let parents and children remember that day by day they are each forming a character and that the features of this character are imprinted upon the books of heaven. God is taking pictures of his people just as surely as an artist makes pictures of men and women, transferring the features of the face to the polished plate. What kind of picture do you wish to produce? Parents, answer this question. What kind of picture will the great master artist make of you in the records of heavens above? We must decide this now. Hereafter, when death shall come, there will be no time to straighten the crooked places in character. Have you been careless? Or that parents will look prayerfully and carefully after their children's eternal welfare? Canon is before us, that is the topic. Let them ask themselves, have we been careless? Have we neglected this solemn work? Have we allowed our children to become the sport of certain temptations? Have we not a solemn account to settle with God because we have permitted our children to use their talents? Their time and influence in working against the truth against Christ, have we not neglected our duty as parents and increased the number of the subjects of Satan's kingdom? Is this the work that you are doing? If mothers neglect to properly educate their children, their neglect is reflected back upon them again, making their burdens and perplexities harder than they would have been if they had devoted time and patient care in training their children to obedience and submission. It will pay in the end for mothers to make the formation of the characters of their children their first and highest consideration, that uh, the thorns may not take root and yield an abundant harvest. Children will condemn unfaithful parents. The curse of God will surely rest upon unfaithful parents. Not only are they planting thorns which will wound them here, but they must meet their own unfaithfulness when the judgment shall sit. Many children will rise up in judgment and condemn their parents for not restraining them and charge upon them their destruction. The false sympathy and blind love of parents cause them to excuse the faults of their children and pass them by without correction. And their children are lost in consequence and the blood of their souls will rest upon their unfaithful parents. Again, faithful children will pay tribute to faithful parents. When the judgment shall sit and books shall be opened, when the well done of the great judge is pronounced and the crown of immortal glory is placed upon the brow of the victor, many will raise their crowns in sight of the assembled universe and pointing to their mother say, she made me all I am through the grace of God. Her instruction, her prayers have been blessed to my eternal salvation. Praise the Lord. This moves me to tears. Will I be of the wrong above which have neglected their duties or will my child point to me and say my dad did his duty faithfully and that is why I am here by the grace of God. Children, parents may bring children with them to the promised land. What a beautiful thought. God has permitted light from his throne to shine all along the path of life. A pillow of cloud by day, a pillow of fire by night. Remember, I told you Canaan before us, and this is what was happening before the wilderness, in the wilderness. A pillar of uh, cloud by day and a pillar of fire by night is moving before us as before ancient Israel. These are lessons from Israel which we have to learn. It is the privilege of Christian parents today, as it was the privilege of God's people of all, to bring their children with them to the promised land. Amen, amen. You want a household for God. You want your family for God. You want to take them up the gates of the city and say, here I am I, Lord. And the children that thou hast given me, there may be men and women that have grown to manhood and womanhood, but they are your children all the same. And you are educating and your watchfulness over them, over them have been blessed of God till they stand as overcomers. Now you can say, here am I, Lord, and the children. Amen. Broken chain, broken family chains will be relinked. Jesus is coming, coming with clouds and great glory. A multitude of shining angels will attend him. He will come to honor those who have loved him and kept his commandments and to take them to himself. He has not forgotten them of his promise. There will be a relinking of the family chain. You know, uh, I won't go into the marriage thing where the husband and wife will stay together. But this quote says there will be a relinking of the family chain. Never forget that. That is um, a very beautiful quote in uh, uh, Child Guidance. 
page uh, 565, uh, it uh, really sheds some light on some things which I can't uh, be able to say fully this um, reunion of uh, the families. And uh, just to put a bookmark on that so that uh, I may have it under my marriage quotes. And so, uh, relinking of families in heaven. I'll always remember that. And so, uh, what a, a jovial uh, reunion will be there in heaven when uh, actually families are uh, relinked. And uh, there are children who have been lost when they are young. We are told that they'll be born in the hands of their mothers if they make it to heaven. And uh, if it's not, then they'll be given to the angels. A comfort for a bereaved mother. You inquire in regard to your little one being saved. Christ's words are your answer. Suffer little children to come unto me. This was uh, Sister White consoling a mother who was lost uh, a young child. Suffer little children to come unto me and forbid them not for of such is the kingdom of God. Remember the prophecy. Thus says the Lord, a voice was heard in Ramah, lamentation and bitter weeping. Rachel weeping for her children refused to be comforted. Thus said the Lord, refrain their voice, their voice from weeping and thine eyes from tears, for thy work shall be rewarded, said the Lord. Remember, thy work shall be rewarded. You raise them in a godly way. So uh, those parents who have been faithful, they, they, their works will be rewarded, said the Lord, and they shall come again from the land of the enemy. And there is hope in thine end, said the Lord, that thy children shall come again to thy own border. What a comfort to this mother. And it can be a comfort to us if our children are removed today. Remember also we are told, just uh, before the seven last plagues, and even during the little time of trouble, little children and old men shall be laid to rest. They may not, they, they, they cannot go through the little time of trouble and the great time of trouble, so the Lord will rest them. So mothers who may be weeping, mothers who may be concerned, family chains will be relinked when we go to heaven. And so we are told that um, they are hid from the calamity that is coming. That is Isaiah chapter 57, verse 1. I can just quickly go there uh, why the Lord will be able to rest uh, these um, uh, little children and uh, uh, old men who cannot go through this period. We are told, uh, look at this very important verse. Uh, the righteous perisheth, and no man layeth it in heart, and merciful men are taken away, none considering that the righteous is taken away from the evil to come. He shall enter into peace, they shall rest in their beds, that is the grave, each one walking in his own uprightness. And uh, you, 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 you can guess where I'm going else, Revelation 14, verse 13. We are told that, um, and I heard a voice, let us just highlight this once again. Uh, and I heard a voice from heaven saying unto me, Right, blessed are the dead which die in the Lord from henceforth. Yea, the Spirit, uh, yea, said the Spirit, that they may rest from their labors and their works do follow them. So when we are told in Isaiah 57, verse 2, each one walking in his uprightness, it means that uh, the work that they did, it follows them. They will not be forgotten. They are in the book of. Uh, uh, remembrance. Uh, I think this is a uh, very comforting uh, uh, verses when uh, it comes to uh, laying to rest uh, our loved ones. Let us mourn as the people who understand that we shall be relinking with them. The promise is yours. You may be comforted and trust in the Lord. The Lord has often instructed me that many little ones are to be laid away before the time of trouble. We shall see our children again. We shall meet them and know them in the heavenly courts. Put your trust in the Lord and be not afraid. Child guidance 566.1. Children will be born to mother's arms. Oh, wonderful redemption, long talked of, long hoped for, contemplated with eager anticipation, but never fully understood. The living righteous are changed in a moment in the twinkling of an eye. At the voice of God, they were glorified. 
Now they are made immortal and with the risen saints are caught up to meet their Lord in the air. Angels gather together his elect from the four winds from one end of heaven to the other. Little children are borne by holy angels to their mother's arms. Friends long separated by death are united, never more to part, and with songs of gladness ascend together to the city of God. Heaven will be cheap enough if we obtain it through suffering. As I saw what we must be in order to inherit glory and then saw how much Jesus had suffered to obtain for us so rich an inheritance, I pray that uh, we might be baptized into Christ's suffering, that we might not shrink at trials, but bear them with patience and joy, knowing what Jesus had suffered, that we through his poverty and suffering might be made rich. Heaven is worth everything. Heaven is worth everything to us. We must not run any risk in this matter. We must take no venture here. We must know that our steps are ordered by the Lord. May God help us in the great work of overcoming. He has crowns for those that overcome. He has white robes for the righteous. He has an eternal world of glory for those who seek for glory, honor, and immortality. Everyone who enters the seat of God will enter it as a conqueror. He will not enter it as a condemned criminal, but as a son of God. And the welcome given to everyone who enters there will be, Come ye, blessed of my Father, inherit the kingdom prepared for you from the foundation of the world, Matthew 25, 34. Quoting uh, Child Guide and 567.2. Again, fathers and mothers, how stands your record? Have you been faithful to your trust? As you have seen your children inclined to follow a course that you know you knew will result in impurity of thought and word and act, have you first, have you first asking God for help, tried to show them their danger? Have you pointed out to them the peril of taking a path of their own choosing? Mothers, have you neglected your God-given work, the greatest work ever committed to mortals? Have you refused to bear your God-given responsibilities? In the time of trouble just before us, when the judgments of God fall upon the impure and unholy, will your children curse you because of your indulgence? God have mass on us. Parents knew in the message need instruction. Those who bear the last message of mercy to the world should feel it their duty to instruct parents in regard to home religion. Do you, do you remember child guidance that parenting is part of the third angel's message? Now here also it's made so clear, those who bear the last message, that is the third angel's message, that is righteousness by faith, I tell you. That the parents may be able to teach their children what is righteousness by faith, what does it mean to uh, depend on the Lord to overcome sin and uh, give him our will for sustenance to guide us in every step that we make. Are, are parents understanding the concept of righteousness by faith? Are they able to teach fully their children so that the children may form a relationship with Christ so that even the man of sin may not convince them uh, to, uh, to, to change their allegiance? The great reformatory movement the, must begin in presenting fathers and mothers and children the principles of the law of God. Family life is the most important subject in this uh, time that we are living in. Because we are going to be a family in heaven, so family life should be taught because it is part of the third angel's message. As the claims of the law are presented and men and women are convicted of their duty to render obedience, show them the responsibility of their decision, not only for themselves, but for their children. Show what obedience to God's word is our only safeguard against the evil that are sweeping the world to destruction. Our youth need help and encouragement. Now is our time and opportunity to labor for the young people. Tell them that we are now in a perilous crisis and we want to know how to discern true goldness. Our young people need to be helped, uplifted, and encouraged, but in the right manner, not perhaps as they will desire it, but in a way that will help them to have sanctified minds. They need good, sanctifying religion more than anything else. Do not delay, mother or father. Coming events are casting their shadow upon our pathway, fathers, mothers, I appeal, you to, I, I appeal to you to make most honest efforts now for your children. Give them daily religious instruction. Teach them to love God and to bring, to be true to the principles of right. With lofty, honest faith directed by the divine influence of the Holy Spirit, work, work now. Do not put it off one day, one hour. Again, do a thorough work, parents. Parents, humble your hearts before God. Begin a thorough work with your children. 
Plead with the Lord to forgive your disregard of his word in neglecting to train your children in the way they should go. Ask for light and guidance, for a tender conscience, and for clear discernment that uh, you may see your mistakes and failures. God will hear such a prayers from a humble and contrite heart. Confession may be necessary. Again, if you have failed in your duty to your families, confess your sins before God. Gather your children about you and acknowledge your neglect. Tell them that you desire to bring about a reformation in the home and ask them to help you to make the home what it ought to be. That is an Adventist home. Read to them their direction, read to them the direction found in the word of God. Pray with them. Ask God to spare their lives and help them to prepare for a home in the kingdom. In this way, you may begin a work of reformation and then continue to keep the way of the Lord. Again, give children an example of strict obedience. The special work of parents is to make the law of God plain to their children and urge their obedience to them, and they may see the importance of obeying God all the way, days of their lives. Pray and work for their salvation. Teach your children that um, the heart must be trained to self-control and self-denial. Pray and work for salvation of the souls of your children. Act as character builders. Seventh day, uh, uh, Seventh day Adventist parents should more fully realize their responsibilities as character builders. God places before them the privilege of strengthening his cause through the consecration and labors of their children. He desires to see he desires to see gathered out from the homes of our people a large company of youth who, because of the godly influences of their homes, have surrendered their hearts to him and go forth to give him the highest service of their lives. Directed and trained by the godly instruction of the home, the influence of the morning and evening worship, the consistent example of parents who love and fear God, they have learned to submit to God as their teacher and uh, are prepared to render him acceptable service as loyal sons and daughters. Such a youth are prepared to represent the world, the power and grace of um, Christ. And uh, as we read these things, uh, my prayer is that uh, they may make uh, a great impression upon our hearts and uh, we may be like trees planted beside um, the, the rivers. We may be like trees uh, planted beside the rivers being watered uh, daily. And so we have responsibilities that um, we need to pray, to play today. And um, uh, in this last part, I, I didn't want to extend this be beyond one hour, but um, uh, allow me to read out some things as just we close. Um, and uh, I, I'll just counterbalance uh, everything uh, as uh, we bring this to a close. Look at this. We cannot serve God and the world at the same time. We must not send our affection on worldly relatives who have no desire to learn the truth. Protect your children from worldly relatives. We may seek in every way while associated with them to let our light shine, but our words, our deportment, our customs and practices should not in any sense be molded by their ideas and customs. We are to show forth the truth in all our intercourse with them. If we cannot do this, the less association we have with them, the better it will be for our spirituality. Don't just be sending your children to relatives who have no spirituality at all. They will come back being enemies to God not loving God anymore. If we place ourselves among associates who influence, whose influence has a tendency to make us forgetful of the high claims the Lord has upon us, we invite temptation and become too weak in moral power to resist it. We come to partake of the spirit and cherish the ideas of our associates and to place sacred and eternal things lower than the ideas of our friends. We are in short leaven, just as the enemy of all righteousness designed we should be. Don't send her around you are unconverted relatives if you will save your children. And uh, uh, another issue is uh, uh, that is uh, what I have been reading, 542.3. I'll go to another thing. In uh, PP 162.1, we should be we should beware of treating lightly God's gracious provisions for our salvation. There are Christians who say, I do not care to be saved unless my companion and children are saved with me. They feel that heaven should not be heaven to them without the presence of those who are so dear. 
But um, have those who cherish this feeling a right conception of their own relation to God in view of his great goodness and mercy toward them? Have they forgotten that they are bound by the strongest ties of love and honor and loyalty to the service of their creator and redeemer? The invitations of mercy are addressed to all, and because our friends reject the Savior's pleading, shall we also turn away? The redemption of the soul is precious. Christ has paid an infinite price for our salvation, and no one who appreciates the value of this great sacrifice of the worth of the soul will despise God's offered mercy because others choose to do so. The very fact that others are ignoring his just claims should arouse us to greater diligence that we may honor God ourselves and lead all who, who we can influence to accept his love. So if people are refusing salvation, if your husband or children are refusing salvation, do your duty. Don't say that heaven will not be heaven without my husband or children. No, you value the, uh, the cost of salvation and work out your way in fear and trembling. And this should not break up families, but even this should call us to a greater consecration. In 4523 again, it is frequently more essential that many, it is frequently more essential than many realize that early association should be broken up in order that those who are to speak in Christ's stead may stand in position where God can educate and qualify them for his great work. Kindred and friends often had, have an influence which God sees will greatly interfere with the instruction he designs to give his servants. Suggestions will be made by those who are not in close connection with heaven that will, if he did turn aside from their holy work, those who should be light bearers to the world. Before God can use him, Abraham must be separated from his former associations that he may not be controlled by human influence or rely upon human aid. Now that he has become connected with God, this man must be must henceforth dwell among strangers. His character must be peculiar, different from all the world. He could not even explain his course of action so as to be understood by his friends, for they were idolaters. Spiritual things must be spiritual designs, therefore his motives and his actions were beyond the comprehension of his kindred and friends. And it will be that uh, it will it, we will have to cut our families far from those who are our family members and dwell amongst the strangers if it means to save them. If that is the only way to save our children, we may be called like Abraham to leave our families, our close associations, and carry our families to places where God can train them to be amongst the people who shall be able to enter heaven. Uh, Fundamental of Christian Education, page 289. There are many in the church who at heart belongs to the world, but God calls upon those who claim to believe the advanced truth to rise above the present attitude of the popular churches of today. Where is the self-denial? Where is the cross-bearing that Christ has said should characterize his followers? The reason we have had so little influence upon unbelieving relatives and associates is that we have manifested little decided difference in our practices from those of the world. Parents need to awake again family life and purify their souls by practicing the truth in their home life. When we reach the standard that the Lord will have us reach, worldlings will regard Seventh-day Adventists as all odd, singular, straight lesser extremists. We are made a spectacle unto the world and to angels and to men. And this is exactly what we want to be by the grace of God that he may make us uh, realize the greatness and the importance of being closer to him. Look at this again. The man who said, I have married a wife and therefore I cannot come represents a large class. Many there are who allow their wives or their husband to pre prevent them from heeding the call of God. The husband says, I cannot obey my convictions of duty while my wife is opposed to it. And this is preval prevalent among us. The husband won't end do anything without wife approving and the wife won't do anything without the husband approving. The wife hears the gracious call, come for all things are now ready. And she says, I pray thee, have me excused. My husband refuses the invitation of mercy. He says that his business stands in the way. I must go with my husband and therefore I cannot come. The children's hearts are impressed. They desire to come, but they love their father and mother. And since these do not heed the gospel call, the children think that they cannot be expected to come. They say, have me excused. All this refuse the Savior's call because they fear division in the family circle. And this we fear so much. No one wants the family to be divided. I can't even advocate for family divisions right now. There are so many things people are facing, brokenness of heart, brokenness of social togetherness. 
and you won't want to add anything to the family, but I cannot go against the word of God. People are refusing the invitation call because the wife is like this, the husband is like this, and the children are like this. We are told this is dangerous. They suppose that in refusing to obey God, they are ensuring the peace and the prosperity of home because they do not want division, but this is a delusion. Those who sow selfishness will reap selfishness. In rejecting the love of Christ, they reject that which alone can impart purity and steadfastness to human love. They will not only lose heaven, but will fail of the true enjoyment of that for which heaven was sacrificed. So don't think that uh, your refusal because you fear family division, it is securing the, their unity. No, this is a delusion. Again, uh, just some two couple of quotes. I saw that uh, we must be willing to go alone and that we must cut loose from everyone who will not walk godly in Christ Jesus. I saw that the unbelief of brother or sister, father or mother, husband, wife or children was no excuse for any to hinder them from doing their duty and that those will lose their and that those will lose their souls if they seek to please their unbelieving friends more than God and they will be counted unwanted to be partakers of a Christ glory. I saw that Jesus was rejected by his own nation. And if Jesus suffered, we must be partakers of his sufferings. Said the angel, cut clear, cut clear, cut clear from everything or anyone that hinders thy progress. I saw that the ties of nature between man and wife, parents and children need not be severed. We don't need to break the close ties or the natural ties between a man and wife or a parent and children. But still, those who believe God and his truth must obey God, even if it's, it, it displeased their nearest and dearest friend. I saw that uh, there would be no ch chance to get ready after Jesus left the most holy place. Therefore, we must get right now while there is chance. Very soon, it will be too late. Don't advocate for people to divorce. Uh, I must say this. We have had reforms, and they are going so quickly. Praise the Lord for that. But then... Let us be careful to find a man and wife having some struggles and we tell the wife, leave that man. We are soon to go to heaven and he's hindering you. Or we tell the husband, if that woman that you have married doesn't want you to serve the Lord, leave him. Leave her. Brothers and sisters, we must not sever the connection between a husband and a wife. We must not come to a place where we are really separating children from their parents. We must train them in a way that even if the wife or the husband or the children do not obey, still there will be that natural affection that they will be moved to work for their salvation rather than casting them aside. If you don't have a divine revelation of divorcing your wife or divorcing your husband or casting out your children or you leaving your parents, please don't make a move because you have heard somebody preaching. It's a time for separation. You may have somebody, you may have heard somebody say that, but it was out of context. I don't advocate for separation of families or divorces just because reforms are going on. And uh, I just want that to be clear. The, the last two quotes that I, I like to read um, is, um, that, that is, um, uh, if we will save our families because we are talking about um uh, 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 Look at this in uh, PH0H138, a call in uh, Revelation 18.4. The command found in Revelation 18.4, come out of her, my people, means to come out of those institutions which will place in the minds of our young people principles which are apt to make them join the class of worshippers of which we read in 2 Timothy 3.5 having a form of goldness but denying the power thereof. As faithful watchmen, we should just we should be just as desirous of getting our children out of the popular schools as we are to call the older people out of the popular churches. The popular churches are only a product of world education. So together, at the root of the matter, we must separate ourselves from that which creates the condition in which all the religious world at present finds itself. And let me just speak a word at this, that um, let us be careful with the, 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 the education of our children. We are told that uh, 
in some instances, the children may get the best out of the secular schools than the Adventist schools because Adventist schools are starting to imbibe the corruption that is in the world. So it may be for a chance better to take your children to a secular school and work out the salvation of that children. Instead of children going to Adventist school and they see that which is opposite to the faith and they hate religion whatsoever. I hope you understand my point. If the child goes to an Adventist school which is corrupted, that child will hate religion. But you can save a child who goes to a secular school, but there are better principles. We have been told that uh, even the worldly parents raise up children better than the Seventh-day Adventist children because they are firm in the principles in their home life. And their children do, do better than even the Seventh-day Adventist children. So don't be shocked when she also says that uh, the secular uh, schools may give a better education to the children than our Adventist schools. You, you had the crisis of Kellogg back in the years 1900s where she says that don't send your children to the Battle Creek because it is a very dangerous place to go right now. Now, where were they to go if uh, Battle Creek, ch our children will not go there? It means that even the secular schools were doing more better than the Battle Creek, where actually falsehood was being spread like nothing else. But I want to leave you on a positive note in this issue of family life. And that is, uh, uh, if all your family members refuse to yield to this uh, call, if your family members refuse to yield to this call, what what shall you do? I, I want just to read 2SG in closing. Uh, I want to read um, 2SG, uh, page uh, 265 to 267 in closing. And uh, I want these thoughts to ring in your mind as you think about family life and canon before us. I want this point to impress your heart. I saw that uh, those who profess the truth should hold the standard high and induce others to come up to it. I saw that some will have to walk the straight path alone. Their companions and children will not walk the self-denying pathway with them. Patience and forbearance should ever characterize the lives of those lone pilgrims following the example of their blessed master. They will have many fair trials to endure but they have a hope that makes the soul strong that bears them up above the trials of the earth, that elevates them above scorn, derision, and reproach. Those who possess a hope like this should never indulge a harsh and kind spirit. This will only injure their own souls and drive their friends further from the truth. Treat them tenderly. Give them no occasion to reproach the cause of Christ, but never yield the truth to please anyone. Be decided, be fixed, fixed, be established, be not of doubtful mind. But uh, if your companions and children will not come, if you cannot win them to yield to the claims of truth, make their lives here as pleasant as possible, never talking about divorce unless your life is in danger, unless somebody is threatening to kill you and you are sure of that, unless, yeah, your life is in danger and you understand it, but we don't advocate for separation because of reforms. If your companions and children will not come, if you cannot win them to hear the claims of truth, make their lives here as pleasant as possible. For all they will ever enjoy will be this poor world. But let not your duty to them interfere with your duty to God. Pursue a straightforward course. Let nothing they may do or say provoke an angry word from you. You have a hope that will yield you consolation and amid the disappointments and trials of life. Your companions and children who will not be induced to tread the narrow cross-bearing pathway with you have not this divine consolation. They should have your pity for this world is all heaven they'll have. Uh, and uh, she, she concludes by saying, I was shown that all who profess the present truth will be tested and tried. Their love for Jesus coming will be proved and manifested to others whether it is genuine. All I saw will stand that all I saw will not stand the test. Some love this world so much that it swallowed up their love for the truth. As their treasures increase here, their interest in the heavenly treasures decreases. The more they possess of this world, the more closely do they hug it to them, as if fearful their coveted treasure will be taken from them. 
The more they possess, the less do they have to bestow upon others, for the more they have, the poorer they feel. Or oh, the deceitfulness of riches, they will not see and feel the ones of the cause of God. So remember, your family should have your pity for this world is all heaven they ever have. And so I pray that these thoughts may impress our minds and uh, we may seek wisdom and the strength from the Lord to guide us because Canaan is before us and the story of the children of Israel in the wilderness is our story right now. How will we end it? Will only two people enter into the Canaan, of, into the land of promise? Or will we take all our family with it and say, Behold, the children whom you have given unto me. Shall we pray? Dear Father, with many trials in this world, what we need is an anchor that cannot be uh, shaken, an anchor that cannot be removed or moved. And we know that you are the Lord who changeth not. You have been and you shall always be. And in the present you are a friend indeed, a friend in need. And you say that we come boldly before thy throne of grace in time of need that we may obtain help. Father, we come that you may save our families. And if we cannot save them, help us to manifest the spirit of Christ. In everything, let your name be glorified now and forevermore in Christ Jesus' name. Amen.